All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our small little blowout. <laughs> Amen. Hey, two or three gathering in my name, there am I with them. Amen. Yeah. Still going to enjoy a great time. Amen. Uh, I don't know about you, but I am very excited. I am very excited because I know that, I mean, I came here to fellowship with the brethren. I came here to sing unto the Lord. I came to hear preaching. I came to be around a King James only, dispensational, Bible-believing, good-spirited environment. Amen. So that's, what, that's the purpose of me coming here. It's not the building, the numbers of the people, or et cetera. It's that kind of environment. So I'm looking forward to what the Lord will speak upon our hearts today. All right, if you'll please stand. Please stand, because you are Bible believers. Let us stand for Jesus Christ and give Him the glory. Amen. All right, if you'll take out your red hymnals and turn to page 496, please. 496 in your red hymnals. Thank you for coming. 496 in your red hymnals, please. All right, unfortunately, we do not have our keyboard today, but church, this is not new to you, right? How long have we sang a cappella? For many, many years, amen? All right, so let's do this. 496. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads upon your heart, let it out. Amen. Amen. Don't contain the Holy Spirit. Here we go. Verse 1, 2, and 3. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me Soul. with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angel singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the 
cleansing flood. Yeah. Hey, Amen. That's good stuff. All right, let's sing, Since the Savior Found Me, 493, please. 493. All right. Uh, I like how the title starts, Since the Savior Found Me, because your imagination can run wild what happened when the Savior found you, bless God. All right, 493. Here we go. Since the Savior found me, pardon all my sin. I have had the joy and living hope within. Gone is all the shame and sorrow of the past. There underneath the precious blood of Christ at last. Say, 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 I'm happy on the way. Say, 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 I love him more each day. Say, 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 I know he's mine each hour. He saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. Since the Savior found me, all to him I owe. For his precious blood has washed me white as snow. Now no condemnation, happy as can be. I'm glad that Jesus justifies and sets me free. Say, say, saved, I'm happy on the way. Say, say, saved, I love him more each day. Say, say, saved, I know he's mine each hour. He saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. Since the Savior found me, I have perfect rest. Living in the realms of joy and happiness, leaning on my Savior, looking for that day when he shall come to catch his waiting bride away. Say, say, saved, I'm happy on the way. Say, say, saved, I love him more each day. Say, say, saved, I know he's mine each hour. He saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. Amen. All right. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Brother Sean, would you do the honor? Start off the service with a word of prayer. Amen. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just put a protective hedge around everyone in this room. So God, Come on. God, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give the Holy Spirit free course in this room. Amen. Fill the pastor with Holy Ghost unction and fill right. the joy that you would give us what you have in store for us today. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, soften each and every one of our hearts, have it to be. Please, Lord. Lord. Yes, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, you may be seated, and we'll fire off with our first sermon. If Pastor Mike Fernandez can come forward. All right, this preacher, he's around the Boston area. He knows several martial arts. You don't mess with him in street preaching. Amen. So it's a blessing. All right, go ahead, preacher. Thank you so much for coming. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, you're gonna... well keep Brother Kim up here. We're going uh, uh, to teach what it means to be choked by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. Thank you, sir. No, I'm, I'm really I'm honored to be here, and I appreciate Brother Kim having me out. And uh, we've been watching his, his stuff on TV and um, the Internet, and it's been a true blessing. And um, I really praise God for each and everyone that's here. I feel humble being in the presence, and especially of these doctors, and I'm a little rough on the edges, as you can see, and, uh, <laughs> and, um, but, um, but I love God's Word, and um, I love the King James Bible, and, uh, and God has showed me some things uh, pertaining to His Word, and um, that's the most important thing, I really believe that, and, um, and God has called us to win souls and to evangelize, and I've had great opportunity to see countless of my students come to know the Lord. And um, in my church, we've got several black belts, several brown belts, guys who, who've been training with me for several years who've come to know the Lord. And now not, not only they, they're battling for the Lord, but they can battle in reality. And so, um, so what I have you do is I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of uh, Ephesians. And what I'm going to do is the way I preach, I, I preach a little bit more expositional um, 
than some of you guys may uh, appear. So we're going to use a lot of scripture tonight. But what I want us to do is I, what my goal tonight is to really see if we can determine what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? You know, and a lot of times I think we kind of get it mixed up. And, you know, and, and we as the, the, the King James elite only, we have a tendency to kind of look down on other people and other Christians and not realize that there, there, there's a whole area of what does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it just doesn't mean that you come to church looking good. You know, listen, you can dress me up and I still look like a bum. I can't even, I couldn't even button my, I couldn't even button my collar today. I tried this shirt on, my neck was too big, guys were pulling on my neck, my, I couldn't even get the collar to button, so I apologize for that. But listen, just because you carry a King James Bible, just because you come to a, a Bible-based church, it doesn't mean that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. To be a follower of Jesus Christ, it's everywhere you go. It's at home. It's at work. It's how you live your life. It's your attitude. It's your spirit. It's your demeanor. And a lot of times we get things a little bit misconstrued about what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And we get hung up on our hobby horses, and we get hung up on all of our different doctrinal issues, but sometimes we forget some of the most practical things in the reality of a Christian, and that's to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And we can get so caught up in different little pet peeves and different little things that disturb us and bother us that that we forget who and what we really are and what it really means to be a Christian and what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So what I want us to do this evening is I want us to look in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and we're going to follow his life and we're going to see where his life leads to. So let's look at this in the book of Ephesians, right? In the book of Ephesians, chapter 5 and verse 1 and 2, the Bible says here, Be ye therefore followers of God. Now I want you to say that word out loud, first of all, as. Does everyone see that word? If you don't understand that, just circle that in your Bible because the word as teaches us a what? A comparison. It's an illustration. As and like are the two most important words in the Bible because that's how you learn that God is giving you and I a what? He's given us an illustration and he's giving us a comparison. He's giving us a great profound truth by those two little words, as and like. So look at this verse again now. It says here, be ye followers of God as what? Dear children. Now, we're to be followers of God as dear children. So the Bible is clear that we are to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to walk in his footsteps. Very clear in the word of God. And so notice what it says, that we're to be followers of God as dear children. And look what it says here, and walk in what? And walk in what, people? Love. And walk in love. Okay? So the concept of being a Christian, and if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you, first of all, you have to learn what love is, and you have to learn to emulate and to demonstrate love in every aspect of your life. A lot of times we get so hung up on being a follower of Jesus Christ, and we forget the most practical and yet the most significant point of being a Christian, and that is love. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and not acting out in love. Your actions have to show it. Your mannerism has to show it. Your demeanor, your speech, every aspect of your life is to emulate the very love of Christ. The Bible says, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you what? If you love one another. So this concept of love here, now notice the word as once again, right? As dear children, look at this, walk in love as Christ has also loved us and has given himself for what? Say it out loud, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So we're to offer ourselves over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what I want you to do is because we're going to make full circle, and I want you to store this verse in the back of your mind. I want you to take this particular portion of Scripture, and I want you to store it in the back of your mind because we're going to come full circle back to this particular point of Scripture. And as we go through this message, we're going to look and see what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And we're going to realize that a lot of times Christians aren't necessarily following Jesus Christ. If we would, let me give you an example. You had Peter and Judas Iscariot. Now, Peter was a follower of Jesus Christ, wouldn't we say that? We would all say, yes, Peter was a follower of Jesus Christ. And then we would take Judas Iscariot. Now, Judas was in the vicinity of Jesus Christ, but was he a follower of Jesus Christ? No. He hung out with the disciples. He had the money bag. And Judas was always in the area, but yet he wasn't a follower of Jesus Christ. And then we take Peter, for example. 
Now, Peter was a follower of Jesus Christ, some of us would say. But have you ever read when Jesus Christ grabbed Peter and, Peter and he said to him, Peter, get thee behind me, what? Satan. So what was Peter doing? He was in front of Jesus at that point. Did you see that? There was a spirit that was working through Peter, and that spirit was an evil spirit, and Jesus had to tell him, Peter, get behind me. So he was ahead of the Lord, and then we see that when, Pete, when Jesus was going to the cross to be crucified, what happened? They were in the garden. What did Peter do? He pulls out a sword, goes to cut the guy's head off, cuts his ear off, and Jesus tells him what? Put away your sword. Put away your sword. He was ahead of the Lord once again. Then we see that when Jesus was being led into the hall to be, to be judged, what did we see? We see Peter following Jesus, say it out loud, afar off. See, he was in the vicinity of Jesus Christ, but he wasn't a follower of Jesus Christ. Peter wasn't a being a follower of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, he was, he was ahead of the Lord. He was behind the Lord. He was all over the board, and yet he wasn't following Jesus Christ. He wasn't following Jesus Christ. And so these are the illustrations that we have to look at. I want to give you a couple other principles, and then we're going to come back to Peter for one minute. But I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 now. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. Now pay attention, okay? These are the key factors of what we're studying tonight. Do not lose sight of these two particular portions of Scripture because they're going to help show you and I how it all links together. Is everyone with me on this? Stay with me, okay? Now watch this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also, say it out loud, he suffered for leaving us an example that we should, say it out loud, follow his steps. Now pay attention. Now who writes this? Peter. See, Peter begins to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, let, just give me a couple of other illustrations here, right? I want you to go, turn to, now let's do this. You're going to turn to the gospel over there in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at verses 19. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Now watch this, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Now look at this. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have a nest, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. <laughs> so one individual says, I'm going to follow you. Jesus says, oh, you want to follow me? I don't even have a place to sleep. I don't have anything. You want to be a follower of me? It's going to cost you something. You want to be a follower of me? Listen, the birds, they have nests. The foxes have holes, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. Jesus is making it complicated to follow him. It's not an easy thing to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It, Jesus, see, this is the format of it. It was never meant to be easy to be a follower of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ said, if you're going to follow me, what? Take up your cross and follow me. It's not an easy thing. We're not going to sit here and wave the banners and think that it's going to be all a bed of roses if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ and all your problems are going to go away and everything's going to be wonderful. That is not the case. Being a follower. Jesus Christ is the most complex thing there is. You are compared to a soldier. You are compared to a warrior. You are compared to a runner. You are compared to a wrestler. You are compared to a, a farmer. Every one of the aspects that you are compared to as a Christian is labor and it's hard work. It is not going to be an easy thing to be a Christian. And so you better prepare for it mentally. You better prepare for it physically. You better prepare for it spiritually, ultimately, because it is going to be the most tasking thing in your life. There isn't going to be anything that is going to be more complex. Look at, he says here, look at verse 21. This gets better. I mean, on three different occasions, look what happens here. Look at verse 21. And another disciple said unto him, look at this, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. <laughs> look at Jesus says, but Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Wow. I mean, man, you got two different guys that want to follow Jesus. One, Jesus tells one guy, hey, I don't even have a place to sleep. I don't have a place to go. He tells the other guy, hey, go let the dead bury the dead. You let those dead people bury the dead. Don't worry about them. You follow me. See, whosoever loves his father or mother more than me is not what? Worthy to be my disciple. Jesus just lays it out. He is not making it easy to be a believer in Jesus Christ. He's not making it easy. Now look at it says here. <laughs> right? This even gets more real brutal. Look at this. But Jesus said unto him, follow me, and let the dead bury the dead, verse 23. And when he, had, when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. They followed him, right? 
Do you guys see that? And what happened? <laughs> and look, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was, co was covered in the, with waves, and, but he was fast asleep. I mean, we have three illustrations here, and each one of them are complex to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not an easy thing. I mean, the disciples follow him. As soon as they're following him, what happens? There comes the storms. You ever try to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ? You ever step out to do something for the Lord and to, and to act on faith? And the next thing you know, all of a sudden, life starts pouring on you. Life starts raining. There's opposition. There's struggles. Listen, every time you set out to do something for the Lord, guess what, folks? It ain't going to get easy. Every time you try to witness, every time you try to preach, every time you try to ministry, you try to write a book, you try to do street preaching, there is going to be opposition. It goes with the territory. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Shall suffer persecution. I mean, it was never meant to be easy. And so just because we come to church and just because we do all these things, it doesn't necessarily mean we're following Jesus. Let me give you an example of this, right? I want you to turn to John's gospel. John chapter 21. Now watch this. John chapter 21. Stay with me. Stay with me. We use Peter as an illustration. We've seen Peter when Jesus says, get thee behind me, what? Satan. Then Jesus Christ says, Peter, put away your sword. He told him to put away his sword. Peter was all over the board. He was literally all over the board. So the Lord rebukes him over here. Now watch this in verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me then more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, unto him, Feed my lambs. Pay attention. He saith unto him again, Second time, Simon, son of John Jonas, uh, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him, the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Now, we know why he asked him three times, because Peter, what, denied him three times. We, we all understand this doctrinally, but let's see what happens here in a practical sense. Look at this, right? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things that thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Now, watch this. Pay attention to verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou what? Look what it says, right? He girded too, himself. Pay attention, guys. What did he do? He girded himself. He was acting in his own strength. He was acting in his own power. He says, when you were young, Peter, you were ahead of me. You're all over the board, Peter. Now that the Holy Spirit is going to come when you were young, you girded yourself. You act in your own power. You act in your own strength. You want to know one of the biggest problems with Christians are? You want to know they act in their own what, people? Power. They act in their own strength. And you know what they do? They gird themselves. Oh, the Lord's called me to do this. And it's like, maybe the Lord didn't call you to do anything. Maybe the Lord called you to love your wife and to love your kids. Maybe the Lord has called you to do something practical and simple. He says he girded himself. Jesus is showing him that he was acting in his power, in his own strength. And now look at this now. Pay attention, guys. And what does it say? He what? Walkest, see the word, whither thou what? See that? He says, you were going in every direction you wanted. You were walking wherever you wanted to go. Oh, Peter was in the vicinity of Jesus Christ. And when there was a church meeting, guess who was there? Peter was there. Guess who else was there in the church meeting? Judas Iscariot. He was there. Was, and Jesus said, have I not chosen you 12? And one of you is a what? He's a devil. So we have to understand just because you come to church, it doesn't mean you're following Jesus. You know who knows when you're following Jesus? Your children know when you're following Jesus. Your wife knows if you're really following Jesus. Let me tell you, she knows. She can write the book and say, oh, no, when it was time to do those dishes, he wasn't following Jesus. He wasn't. Listen, and to follow Jesus, you're always demonstrating what? Love and humility and compassion. Men, sometimes you may need to go what? As dear, walk in what? Love. Sometimes we may need to go back to 1 Corinthians and 13, 13 and do a little expositional preaching on 13, okay? Now, but let's see what happened there, right? This is just an example. In walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another watch this, shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. That's pertaining to his death. Now look at it says, this spake he signifying by what? 
death, he should, he should, should glorify God. I love that. He, he glorified God through what, people? Through death. Do you understand that? He glorified God through a sacrifice of his own life. Now pay attention to that. Let's keep going on, right? And let's look at this, right? And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, say it out loud. Did you see that? He says, Peter, before you were walking with our what? He was all over the board. He says, you were walking where you wanted to go. You were behind me, afar off. You were in front of me. You cut the guy's ear off. Peter, you jumped in the, Peter, you were out of your mind. You were all over the board. He's, Jesus is telling them, you girded yourself. You did things in your own power, in your own strength. Now he's telling them, I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me. Judas Iscariot was in the presence of Christ. He wasn't following Jesus Christ. Peter was in the presence of Christ, but he was all over the board. You know what happens to some of these young guys get in ministry or think they're supposed to be in ministry? They're all over the board. They're girding up their law and strength, and they're working in their own power, in their own substance. And they haven't even sat still and just say, Lord, what will thou have me to do? What do you want me to do, God? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Peter was all over the board. Now, watch how crazy he gets over here. He's still not right. So Jesus says, for, um, watch this, right? He says, follow me. Now look at verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, loved following. Now watch this. Which also leaned on, on, the, on, the, on the breast at supper and said, on, and said Lord, which, watch this. Which is he that betrayeth thee? And look at this. Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Now, I love the way the Lord answers him. Look at this. Jesus saith unto him, if, if I will, that he tarry till I come, knowing that John's a type of the church. But let's keep going on devotionally. And he says here, what, that, he says, what is that? Say it out loud. Peter, what is it to you? What is it to you? Peter's like, hey, what's going to happen with him? What's going to happen with John? And he just looks at him and he just goes, what's it to you? The problem was, is Peter wasn't minding his own what? Beeswax. I mean, sometimes Christians got to just learn to mind your own business and stop worrying about so-and-so and so-and-so. Oh, who didn't show up for church today? Oh, brother so-and-so didn't wear a tie. You know, it's like, come on, guys. It, listen, he says, listen. He said, he's like worried about John. He shouldn't have been concerned about John. Jesus just told him what? Follow me. He says, you follow me. And you know what he's doing? He's too concerned about everybody else. Wow. Listen, you want to know what will keep you from following Jesus? You being concerned about everyone else. Oh, Mrs. So-and-so didn't have a dress on today. Ooh. Oh, brother so-and-so didn't wear a tie. I'm about ready to tear my tie off. I couldn't even button my top. Listen. This, this is how people think, though. Yeah. We start to worry about what other people are thinking, and guess what? You're not even being a follower of Jesus Christ. Yeah. If you're worried about somebody else and thinking about somebody else, you can't even follow Jesus Christ because you're too concerned about what other people are doing. Yeah. And you're all over the board. You'd be all over the board. This is what the life of Peter is, it's like, I'm not even teaching on Peter. We're going to get to my message. Just give me one minute. But here's the thing, right? Peter is all over the board. He's just our illustration. He's worried about everybody else but himself. Even after Jesus Christ told him, what? Follow me. I mean, I love the way the Lord answers him. You see that again? He says, what is it to you? What is it to you? What, what does it matter to you? What does it matter to you? Brother Jack comes in here with that big country hat on. What does it matter? What does it matter? He looked a little crazy. He had a toothpick in his mouth. I thought he was going to stick me in the eye with the thing. But what does it matter? The brethren can be so quick to judge other brethren and to be worried so much about other Christians that they forget to follow Jesus. He get hung up on all the little details, on all the little quirks, and all the little issues that you forget that you're supposed to be following Jesus. Stop worrying about everybody else. Stop worrying about 
Who? What so-and-so? Oh, so-and-so didn't show up for church. So-and-so was late for church. The brother in a brutal. I'm going to give you the story. I have to give you the story. I have to give you the story. I, I, we went up to a church. I won't mention the church because this is on Streamline. But we went to visit a church, and I wasn't preaching. And so I said, I'm not preaching, so I'm going to go in jeans and T-shirt and sneakers. So I walk in there, and I had another thug looked up guy looking with me. He looked like a thug, and we walked in, and the thugs were the thugs. And we walk in, and we sit down, and everyone's looking at us. The brethren have their ties on. They're all staring at us like, what are these guys doing here? Did they come to rob us? <laughs> and, and I'm trying to be friendly. Not one of the Christians in that church approached me. Not one. They're looking at us, and they're going, I don't want to say anything, but you guys are all familiar with them. But anyways, that's a whole other story. And so, so I'm sitting there. Everything's cool. And, and there was a guest preacher there. It was Mel Sabaka. And I knew Mel from way back. So I, I go up there, and everyone's flaunting all over Mel, hugging him and, you know, worshiping Mel. Mel's a great man, a great man of God. I went over to Mel. He looks at me. He's like, my, grabs me, hugs me, kisses me. He's holding me like this. Everyone's like, oh, Mel must have knew him from prison. And so, and so he's hugging me. He's kissing me, right? And, and, then, and then he asks me what I'm doing. I tell him what I'm doing. Next thing you know, he's like, he has me stand up, give a quick testimony, lead, open up in prayer, you know. And uh, next thing you know, all the brethren are like, oh, he's okay. <laughs> you know what they were doing? They were worried about what? About me. They weren't even thinking about what, be, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and coming over to some rough looking kid and saying, hey, brother, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's I don't want you to feel out of place. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, the brethren can't make me feel uncomfortable. Trust me. <laughs> Great peace of they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Nothing. I remember the first time I heard Dr. Ruckman preach, we went out there, and I was sitting in the front row, and he goes, yeah, well, up north, you got those porch monkeys and those, those, uh, those wops, and I was sitting with my Italian friend, Vinny. <laughs> Listen, I just, we just smiled and said, hey, man, if you can't take a joke, you can't take a joke. You know, it's like, but listen, what, what do we do? We are too concerned. Seriously, guys, we're so concerned about what other people are doing. We forget to follow Jesus Christ. We forget to follow Jesus Christ. We're so quick to look at everybody else, to look at everything else, and forget that we're to be followers of Jesus Christ. And we're to what? Walk in what? Love. You see that? We're to walk in love. Let's give you the illustrations here. Let's kind of really dive into this message and see what we're going to look at tonight now. Uh, what I'm going to do is I want to give you some real points about what does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Number one, point number one, we follow the master in submission. I'm not going to take you through all the scriptures. I'll throw them out at you. But we follow the master, number one, through submission. We have to, number one, submit to the word of God, submit to the will of God, submit to the work of God. You have to understand. What did, what did we see? To, the act of submission is obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. To be baptized, you're submitting to God's authority. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to submit to the authority of your pastor. You're going to submit. You're going to bring your life under the subjection to the local New Testament church. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, what was Jesus doing? He was in submission to the will of the Father. What was his first act of obedience? It was when he went out and he got baptized. And then he was led where? Into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. After he showed submission, after he showed obedience, then the attack is on. Yes, sir. But you, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, number one, you have to live a life of total submission. The book of Ephesians 5.21, it says, submit yourselves one to another. One to another. Now, here's where it gets tough. You get some of these men, they want to walk around. I don't submit. And they're bullying their wives at home. They don't know what submission is. And maybe, the, maybe this preacher needs to choke him out. <laughs> I'll teach you submission, man. I see, I see this. You guys think I'm kidding? I see guys down talk to their wives, bully their children. That's not submission. It's not submission. Oh, she's supposed to submit to me. The Bible says, submit yourselves one to another as unto the Lord. You know what submission is? You submit yourself one to another. Those dishes need to be done. Do the dishes. <laughs> oh, that's the woman's job. Knock it off. 
Come up here and I'll show you what submission is. You guys are crazy. So the, the following the Lord Jesus Christ, first, if it's, a, it's, a, it's a life of what? It's a life of submission. Not only is it a life of submission, but it's a life of service, okay? We don't have time to get into all of these illustrations, but I'm going to give you one illustration. It's a life of service. Well, where do we serve? You remember Jesus Christ, before he was going to be crucified, he rises from supper, he puts aside his garment, he takes upon the disciples' feet, and he washes the feet. You know what he was teaching them? To be a what? To be a servant. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know what you're doing? You're living a life of submission, and you are looking for a place to serve under the authority of your pastor. You're not going to say, I'm going to go start my own church. You fool. You're not going to start your own church. You've got to be under his submission, under his authority. And then he will teach you the areas where you need to serve. Listen, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it's through submission and it's through service. You cannot follow Jesus Christ apart from submission and apart from service. Jesus Christ took the disciples' feet. He washed them, all of them, including Judas Iscariot. And then once again, what does Peter do? Puts his own foot in his mouth. <laughs> Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Peter, once again, all over the board. We have to serve, number one, with humility, with sincerity, and willfully. But understand this, right? Serving, a lot of people don't serve with humility. And a lot of people don't serve with sincerity. Let me explain this to you. A lot of people want the pat on the back. Oh, brother, <laughs> you were helping me. That was good. And you go, oh, yeah. We're like a dog. We want that praise. We want the treat. It's like, listen, forget the praise. Forget the treat. If you're doing it for the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not looking for a pat on the back. You're not looking for a reward. You're not looking for somebody to say, oh, boy, that was good stuff, man. No, you're just doing what you're supposed to do because you're ser serving with humility and you're serving with sincerity. You're not looking for anything else. You're just doing what God has called you to do. You're just being obedient to the will and to the work of the Heavenly Father. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, think about what he did. He washed those disciples' feet willingly, even Judas Iscariot. Wow. Can you just think about this for a minute. Can you imagine washing those disciples' feet? You get to Peter's big old foot. <laughs> I mean, then you get to Judas' foot. Maybe Judas' foot had a hook on it. I don't know, brother. Maybe, disp maybe dispensationally you can help me with that. But who knows? But Jesus still, you know what he did? He still washed his feet. He still took somebody that betrayed him and washed his feet. Then Judas came and kissed him in the garden. And Jesus says, you betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss? His mercy was still there washing the disciples' feet. You want to talk about service. <laughs> Man, that's a, that's, a, that's a big act, is to be able to serve with humility and with sincerity and compassionately to serve one another. The Bible, I mean, I've got so many scriptures here. I don't have time to go through them. I apologize for that. But the Bible talks that we're to serve one another with humility. Then we follow the master. Point number three, in suffering. You have to follow the master in suffering. Now I want you to understand this principle of suffering. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Peter talks about this. He says, for even hereunto were you called. Called to what? Called to suffer. Do you understand that? Your calling as a Christian, you are called to suffer the reproach and the ridicule in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what you are called to do. You are called to do that. Well, Pastor Mike, I don't like that. Well, get used to it because it's, it's part of the territory. You've got to get used to it. You've got to learn to embrace it because remember what Jesus Christ said, blessed are you when what? Men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. You want, a, you want persecution? Hey, man, guess what? It's part of the game. Well, I don't feel comfortable like that. Well, get, get comfortable with it. Get comfortable with it because great is your reward in heaven. 
Great is your reward in heaven. Listen, suffering goes with being a Christian and being in the pattern and following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said what? If you're going to follow me, take up your what? Your cross and follow me. The cross is a place of death. The cross is a place of anguish. The cross is a place of pain. It's a place of suffering. And if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. The cross is a place of pain and anguish and suffering. You've got to say, I'm going to take up that cross and follow Jesus Christ. I don't care what happens, but I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We know the scriptures, all of them. I have all this stuff laid out here. We don't need to go through them. But lastly, you have to follow the master through sacrifice. You want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Okay. Where does it begin? A life of submission, a life of service, a life of suffering. Now pay attention. Then what did Jesus do? He picked up that cross. You want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Take up your cross daily. But let's, let's rewind this just a little bit. Let's talk about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You have to follow him first of all into Gethsemane. Then you have to follow him till Golgotha, then you have to follow him to the grave. There's three aspects to this. Pay attention. Stay with me, people. Three aspects to this following Jesus Christ. Number one was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter, James, and John fell asleep. Did you get it? They didn't go all the way with him. He says, guys, when I need you most, couldn't you be with me and pray with me? They were asleep. The other disciples were stones throw away, right? We know the Bible. They were stones throw away. You have the condition of Christians. Some of them are so far off, they don't even know what's going on with the Lord. They don't even know. Peter, James, and John are sound asleep. They weren't following Jesus. The Bible says it's time now, high time now to what? Awake out of sleep. It's high time to awake out of sleep. You want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? I explained it to my brother over here. You know what happens? The cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life, they choke you and you become unfruitful. You know what they do? Listen, the cares, the riches, and the pleasures, none of those are sin. Cares, paying your bills, everything you have to do. The riches, making money to survive, and the pleasures, they're going to choke you, and you're going to become unfruitful. Pay attention. When you get choked out, does anyone want to come up here so I can use the illustration? Of course. Of course. And, but what happens is it's one of the most scary, terrifying things because you go unconscious. When you go unconscious, you wake up, you don't know who you are, where you are, or what has just conspired. You're lost. The average Christian is asleep. And then you have the other ones that are a stone's throw away from following Jesus into Gethsemane. See, Gethsemane, brother, is where the decision is made. It's where the battle was fought to go all the way. The battle was fought in Gethsemane. You see, that's when Jesus battled with the devil. Most Christians, pay attention, never make it to Gethsemane. They never make it to Gethsemane. They're either asleep or they're a stone's throw away. They don't even make it to Gethsemane. Oh, do they go to church? Yeah. Do they carry a King James Bible? Yeah. But they don't even know what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. They didn't follow his footsteps into Gethsemane. Then you have to follow his footsteps to Golgotha. Oh, I don't have time to get into all the scriptures. I wish I did. But let me tell you something. Golgotha is the place where you take up your place on the cross with Jesus Christ. When Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I, but Christ what liveth in me. You want to know why Christ can't live in a lot of Christians? Because they've never taken their rightful place on the cross. They've never taken their rightful place. Now pay attention. You've got to follow him to Gethsemane. You've got to take up your cross. 
follow him till Golgotha, the place of death, the place where you present your body literally as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And you are no longer conformed to this world, but you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now watch. <laughs> Here's where it gets good. Then he goes where? To the grave. Now understand this, right? Unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it what? It abides alone. You know where the power is, people? The power is in the grave. The power is in the grave. That's where Christ resurrected. That's where Christ rose again. Listen, when you live the crucified life and you die to yourself, that's where the power is. That's the power. You will never have power to bear fruit. You will never have power to see souls saved. You will never have power or the anointing until you follow Christ all the way to Gethsemane, all the way to Golgotha, and then all the way to the grave, and then the resurrected life is lived through you. It's lived through you. Christ can't be resurrected in you until you've rightfully taken the place in the grave. You want to be a follower of Jesus? Oh, boy. It's a life of what? Submission. It's a life of service. It's a life of suffering. It's a life that leads to what? Gethsemane, Golgotha, and then to the grave. But it's a life, ultimately, that leads to God's kingdom and God's glory. That's what it means to be a Christian question is, are you a follower of Jesus Christ tonight? Are you really a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, I'm here tonight, Pastor Mike. You know what that means? Nothing. What are you doing at home? What are you doing at work? What are you doing when nobody's watching and nobody's around? How's your attitude? How's your demeanor? How's your life? Turn back to Ephesians now. Watch how this sums together. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Let's sum it up. Ephesians chapter 5, 1 and 2. Now look at this. Be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in what? Love, as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. We're to what? Be followers of God as what? Dear children. And we're to walk in love. Notice the important word, as. We're to live like Jesus Christ. In our personality, our actions, our speech. I wish I had time to take you back through 1 Corinthians 13. So many times we forget the main crux of Christianity. And listen, I'm guilty for it. And if there's any group of fundamental Bible of Christians that are guilty for it, it's this group. It's this group. We can be so judgmental and critical and condescending. And we get so negative towards other brethren. Listen, they might not have all their doctrine right, but some of them will demonstrate love more than some of the brethren. You want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Oh, boy. You got to take up your cross. Jesus says, and follow me. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's not easy, folks. Let's bow our heads forward to prayer, and then our brother Kim come. Lord, we thank you and praise you for who you are, Lord, and we thank you for the word of God. And I thank you for these people, Lord, and I pray that you'd help them to walk in love. Help them to understand what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, they'll be burdened. Well, they'll weep for people who are lost and have a burden for people that are engulfed and involved in sin and not be judgmental or critical or even making jokes that aren't, that aren't really appropriate and so many things that we can do 
and how we don't demonstrate love and not following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. But help us to walk in his footsteps, have his personality, his love, his grace, his humility. And I pray that Christ will be manifest in our mortal flesh. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And Lord, we thank you and we pray that you would mold us and shape us into the very image of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Tell you what, I've already got my cup filled up. I really, really appreciate that. That was a blessing. And, uh, you know, he's from Georgia and I'm from Boston. <laughs> I've got a message I'd like for you to preach one time, and I'm, you probably have maybe from that passage over in Philippians, you know, uh, basically the title is Don't Worry About It, you know, and I call it Forget, it, forget About It. Forget about it. Uh, he can say it right. It. That's it, man. That's, that'll preach, brother. That was good. I appreciate that. And it's amazing how the Lord works things out because I believe what we have here, Joshua chapter 3, if you will, I believe it goes, it fits like a hand in a glove with the previous message. And the Lord knows how to work those things out. So, But if you'll turn to Joshua chapter number 3, thank you so much for inviting me out here. Pastor Kim, what a blessing you are to me and to so many people. We appreciate the hospitality. It's just good to be here and be able to get in the Bible together. And see what God's got from the scriptures here. Joshua chapter number 3 will begin in verse number 1. The Bible says, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed. After three days, the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, the priests, the Levites, burying it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When you are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, you shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every man a tribe. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest on the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon an heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as soon as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, but the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap, very far from the city Adam, that is, beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, fell and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the message. Preacher, will you pray for us?
Amen. If you will, I want to draw your attention to verse number three, the last three words of that verse when Joshua tells them, when they see the priest go into the ark, I want you to do, and he gives three words, go after it. And this follows exactly the message the brother just preached about following the Lord. But I want you to think just for a minute, I got to get a little closer to you. I feel like I'm way back. <laughs> I want you to think about what we're dealing with in the context of Israel's history right now. You've got to realize this is the second generation. The first generation had all perished. Remember Kadesh Barnea, when they came up and they rebelled against the Lord, the Lord wasted out that generation. Twenty years and younger, plus Joshua and Caleb, were the only ones there, and he raised up a second generation from the nation of Israel. There were some people there that had done the right thing, but the ten spies that did the wrong thing, but they had to go 40 years in the wilderness journeys. The whole time from Egypt all the way to this point is what the whole storyline of the nation of Israel is leading up to. I think we don't realize contextually here the the culmination of Israel's history all comes down to this point of crossing over the Jordan River into Canaan land. This is the whole storyline of Moses bringing Israel out of Egypt. This is the culmination point. They had been preaching about it. They had been prophesying about it. They had been talking about it. This generation that watched the old generation die off, they had been looking forward to it. They heard their fathers and their mothers tell them about it. They had read the scriptures about the prophecy. Everything was leading up to this point. And Joshua gives a commandment. He says, when they, those priests go into that water, I want you to go after it. He's encouraging them whenever they see the water part, it's like you have all the old past is rolled back. And now you have a clear path laid out for the second generation. And now the second generation of the believers, yeah, the first generation did their thing, but now the second generation can follow and go after it. It's time as Bible believers, we go after it. It's time that we get with it, if I can put it in modern colloquialism. I want to encourage you to get with it. I want to encourage you to go after it. We got a fighter in here, and I'm sure he can testify to this. Sometimes the only person cheering for you is your coach in the corner. And everybody else thinks you're going to lose, and you're on the, you're on the mat, and you're huffing and you're puffing, and your, your guts are all over the floor. Your breath is knocked out of you, but you can hear somebody in the corner cheering you on, saying, hey, get up and go after it. Hey, get up and go after it. That's what we need. Sometimes we need a pep rally. Sometimes we need a blowout. We need to blow it in and blow it up and blow it out. And take a little bit of this out there. Take a little bit of this encouragement into the waves of discouragement. And Joshua says you need to go after it. So I believe if we can look at this passage, we might can get some things that will help us along the way as we realize where we are, where we came from, and where we're going. Look in the passage, if you will. You'll notice what he mentions in Joshua chapter number 3 as he moves through here. In verse number 6, Joshua tells the priests the instructions of what they're supposed to do. And then in verse number 7, the Lord said to Joshua, this day will I begin to magnify thee. That goes back to chapter number 1, if you remember. He said, as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. Okay, so he told him that in Joshua chapter number 1, and he gave him some specific instructions, and now God's reaffirming this, and he's letting him know, Joshua, you're the guy. You've got to realize when we go after it, when we follow the Lord like the brother preached, when we go that narrow road, the path less traveled, when we cross over Jordan from the past to the future, we've got to realize there's a succession to God's order. We have to realize tonight that there's some other people that have been before us. There's a Moses before there's a Joshua. There's a Paul before there's a Timothy. There's an Elijah before there's an Elisha. And I think sometimes we just blaze the trail and we think it's all about us. And let me say here as we sit in this great country, hey, and I'm an American, amen. I ain't going to apologize for that. Number one, I'm a Christian. Amen. And there's some things in this country that's against the Bible, so I'm against some of the things in this country that are against the Bible. I'm a Christian, number one, but I'm an American. My grandfather fought in World War II. My wife's grandfather fought in World War II. I'd, I'd fight for this country if I had to. 
There's some people that laid down their life so we can do what we're doing in here in freedom. Amen. There's some people as far as Bible believers that are dead and gone now that paved the way for us to be able to enjoy some good doctrine, some good preaching, and some good dispensational study. And I know your pastor here has taught you some things along the lines of church history. You see, if you don't know where you came from, you ain't going to know where you're going. Amen. There's a succession to God's order. It's Moses and then it's Joshua. We need to understand that we have to realize where we came from. When you read on Joshua chapter 3, you move into chapter 4 and you know the story. He tells them, look, I know that we're gone through and we're almost finished and they're gonna, everything's going to, the water's going to come back down. But before that happens, we need to do some things here. Before that happens, we need to take some stones. You see what he says in chapter number 4? Come down to chapter number 4. Notice in verse number, uh, verse number 3. Take out from the midst of Jordan out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm twelve stones. And carry them with you. Leave them in the lodging place. So there's the dry ground where everybody passed over. It says get twelve stones carried out there. But then notice in verse number 7. No, uh, where is it? Number 9. Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan. There are stones of remembrance. We have 12 stones taken out to show us where we came from, and we have 12 stones left in to show us the past has to be buried. What did he say in Joshua chapter number 1? Moses, my servant, is dead. You see, when you think about what we're doing here as we're getting ready to go after, we've got to realize dealing with the past and dealing with the present and dealing with the future, we've got to realize that Moses has to die before there is any more progression. God has an order to how he does things in the history of the nation of Israel. Moses could not bring Israel into the land. He couldn't do it. Joshua had to. Of course, that shows you the law can't save you. Jesus can. Joshua's Jehovah saves. There's some typology there, but you have to realize there is a succession to how God does things. Do you realize in the wilderness they didn't fight any wars? There had to be the wilderness first before there's the wars. There had to be the cross before the crown. God's got an order of how he's doing things here. You see, we just don't open up, you know, Exodus, and here they are the Jordan River getting ready to cross into the promised land. They've got to go through all the stuff that you read about. I nicknamed the book of Numbers the book of slaughter. You ever read Numbers? The Lord's wiping them out left and right, man. They do something wrong, he punishes them, kills a thousand here, kills a few thousand here. I mean, it's the book of judgment. And this younger generation, they see that. They're watching that. They're seeing this. They're watching their fathers die out and their grandfathers die out and their grandmothers die. And they see that God keeps his promises. They see that be sure your sin will find you out. They see it does matter that you, that you do what God tells you to do. Amen. There's a succession to God's order and you'll see that it's Moses and it's Joshua and he says, let's get these stones. We've got to take some stones out so we can never forget where we came from. But we've got to leave some stones there because the past will be buried. He just preached on it. Folks, we can't live in the past. We can't. We're not in an America of 1920s or 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s or the 1800s. I'm not fighting the Civil War anymore. Well, I'm going to go get my gun. Well, they're going to get their drones. Your little guns, nothing compared to the drone that they're going to have in front of your door, you know. It's craziness. You have to let the past bury. God has an order in your Christian life of how he's going to do things if you want to go after him, if you want to follow him, but there's an order, and timing is so, so important, like the brother preached. How are you going to get resurrection power unless you go through Gethsemane? How are you going to get resurrection power unless you go to Calvary? How are you going to get resurrection power unless you go to the grave? We want to have John's revelation, but we don't want to be exiled on Patmos. There has to be the wilderness before the war. you got to go through the hard places before you get on the mountaintop. You've got to go through the trials before you have the blessings. The succession to that. And I think as we go through the passage and we work through it, we see that. But also, if you'll notice, when you get to chapter number 5 here, the Canaanites and the Amorites, they begin to hear about Israel and kind of the the excitement's building up. God is beginning to do something as His hand begins to move on the nation 
of Israel. And then verse number 2 of chapter 5 is kind of like the middle part of the sermon when the Lord kind of just quiets you down. Look at it, verse number 2. Joshua, make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. He says, get your sword out. Instead of using it on the enemies first, use it on yourself. You see, circumcision was what God gave Abraham to do, and it was passed from Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob, and that was an Israel thing, and that was something they were supposed to do. In the Abrahamic covenant, not even the Mosaic covenant, although he commanded them some things under the Mosaic law, they did not do that even with the second generation. You know, that's something the first generation had right, the second generation didn't have right. I know you know more Bible than they might have knew in 1910, and you should. Amen. Yeah, sure. They've made some advances in mathematics since 1900, right? They've made some advances in science since the 1800s, right? They should, we should make some advancements in our Bible knowledge and Bible understanding. Amen. Thank God there's progressive revelation. Yeah. Thank God we got some things right they didn't have right. right. However, they got some things right we ain't got right. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. How come you forgot to circumcise your kids? How come you forgot to circumcise yourself? And you're all worried about going out here and pulling a big bad sword on these guys. You need to turn the sword on yourself. You're not ready to face the enemy. You can't even face yourself. The belt of truth that we talk about, your loins girt about with truth, we're like, hurrah, the truth, you know, I'm going to slap everybody with the truth. Are you truthful with yourself? That thing has to do with honesty. How can you go out and be telling somebody the truth when you won't listen to the truth when it's being preached to you? How come you won't, when you read the Bible, you just gloss over and don't realize those verses are cutting you. They are circumcising you. They are slaying the enemies in your own heart instead of the enemies out in the world. If we're going to go after it, if we're going to follow the Lord, we are going to have to turn the sword on ourselves. I think that's a very important part in the passage. They had to do that, and they left themselves vulnerable at that point because now they were, all their warriors, all their men, they were sore for several days. They were not in any position to fight. It took a step of faith for them to do that. Be honest and say, okay, I'm going to go in surgery. Any of you had surgery? You know some people have had surgery? You go there and... They check you in, and then you have to go through, and then, you know, before they come to, to take you in, then you're going to, the anesthesiologist is always going to come talk to you. That guy could kill you, you know that? You got to sign your life over to that guy. Okay, if you kill me, I want my, my, my wife won't sue you, you know. He's going to come in and talk to you, make sure all the things, doctor may come in and check with you, and you're pretty much laying yourself open. I'm, I'm trusting you to, to do this work on me. Preacher, I'm a Bible believer. Okay, will you let the Bible work on you? That's the question. If you want the profit from Gilgal, you must pay the price and suffer the pain of Gilgal. It rolls that reproach away. And I believe it takes the sting off. It might help us when we deal with the enemy if we've been dealt with ourselves. It might help us like the preacher was talking about. We may have a little more compassion when we deal with somebody because we'll realize I'm just as bad as that guy. I'm no better than him. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be in the gutter. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be a drunk. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be on drugs. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be on my way to hell. Put the sword on ourselves and see what God may do. You ready to go after it? Okay. Paul says that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. I press toward. In other words, I'm following after. Follow the leader. I'm following Jesus. I'm trying to live like the preacher preached, to be a Christian. Well, you know, as Bible believers, we know more than group. I'm not trying to be cocky. He's, he talked about we're Bible-believing dispensational blowout, right? We ought to know more, but we know more and do less. Yes, you know what I've seen in my own life, and I've also seen in the lives of Christians and Bible that I know, I'm talking about King James only, rightly dividing, 
all the doctrines right, I've seen they still have some of the same problem that the evangelicals have. They still have some of the same sin problems. The divorce rate doesn't seem to be much different. Their kids seem to be just as rebellious. They have same pro- the same types of problems with sin that all the other Methodists and Presbyterians and whoever has. You know, if we know more, it should affect us more. There must be a problem with us with reading the Bible just for knowledge instead of reading the Bible and, let it, and letting it work on us. What's the purpose of reading the Bible? What's the purpose of rightly dividing the Word? You see, you get in a car, and the purpose of the car is to go down the road, not to shine it up and put some big wheels on it and a boom-boom box in it. It just shakes everything. And you never move the car, you just sit in the driveway. (laughs) If the car doesn't go down the road, what's the purpose of it? If reading your Bible doesn't make you holier, doesn't make you cleaner, what's the purpose of it? Just to fill our heads, 1 Corinthians 8, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. We've got to turn the sword on ourselves. Joshua said, before we go out there, we've got to do some business here. We don't need revival out there yet until we have revival in the church house. It needs to start on the inside and then go to the outside. And if we just do it on the outside, it'll just be mechanical. It'll just be working up in the flesh. It'll just be out of duty and out of discipline and not out of devotion. Thank God for duty. Thank God for discipline. I believe in those things. I believe in reading the Bible even when you don't feel like it. I believe in going to church whenever the doors are open. But if it's only out of duty and discipline, it won't last. You must fall in love with Jesus Christ or it ain't going to last. Can't move on until the flesh is cut away flesh has got to be cut away. Now notice in verses 11 and 12 after Gilgal they have to learn another lesson as they continue to follow crossing over this very momentous decision here of crossing over Jordan going into Canaan. Verses 11 and 12 notice they learn that you can't live off of yesterday's miracles. The manna's gone. Thank God for the miracle manna. m and M's. <laughs> Miracle manna! I wonder if they had a peanut butter flavor. (laughs) Thank God for the miracle manna. But you can't live off that. The Lord says, okay, you had the manna for the wilderness, and that's good for there, but it's time that you eat off the old corn. He said, it's old. Yeah, it's old, but it's new to them. The same book's been around since the Lord wrote it. But it can be new and fresh to us. I can learn that I can't live off yesterday's miracles. And I thank God for leftovers, amen? I'm glad for leftovers. Don't y'all like leftovers? Especially around Thanksgiving time. Man, that stuff's better. What about soup where you make soup or chili? I don't know about the, uh, I had some uh, ramen, so that was pretty good. He took me to a ramen house. But uh, I don't know if I don't know if ramen's better leftover or not, but I know with soup and stuff, when you make soup and you put it in the refrigerator and you let it sit there, the next day or a couple of days later, that's just better got a richer flavor. And sometimes what God will do is he'll give you some leftover, but you can't keep eating those leftovers because you know what will happen? You know what happened to that manna, don't you? It bred worms. Something good can become something bad. Something that That's when routine becomes rotting, becomes a rut, it becomes a grave with both ends kicked out. You have the form of godliness but denying the power thereof. You just keep going back to the same thing. You ever hear, look, and I'm, I'm all for testimonies and it's great to talk about when you got saved. Thank God God saved me. I, 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 I thank God for that. But every sermon I preach is not going to be the same testimony. I'm not going to preach the same sermon over and 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 talk about the same things over and over and over and just take something that's good and pure and just let it turn into a corruption. I think worms. 
And so they had to eat off the old corn of the land and can't live off yesterday's miracles. They had to learn that things are changing. And you know what? Things are changing. This is the second generation. I mean, here we are. We haven't realized they have, they call, they call it now your digital lifestyle. You know about your digital lifestyle? And then your phone starts talking to you and telling you all about yourself. Things you didn't even know. You spent one hour less than your screen time this day. Would you like to go to lunch at the same place today? Now I've created a separate consciousness with this little device. Man's trying to become God. He's trying to create life is what's happening, if you don't realize it or not. But we have to realize we are in this age, whether we like it or not. Hey, I'd like to be back in the old days sometimes, except when I think about no air conditioning. Now, if you live in Florida like I live, we have mosquitoes that will literally pick you up and carry you off. My little dog goes outside. I have to watch her because the mosquitoes may pick her up and carry her off. And the humidity. I mean, good night. I don't have hair problems, but my wife, she says, what's the use in fixing my hair? The humidity. As soon as you step out, just zzzz. And so I say, you know, I'm glad I live in this age because I can hit a button and turn on the air conditioner. Get in these new cars, hit a button, turn on the air conditioning seat. I got a seat, this air conditioner. Man, that's awesome. You know, we're in a different generation. We're dealing with people that have a digital lifestyle. That if it's not, if it's something that's not going to be on the phone or the internet, they're not going to hear about it. You hand them a 55 page booklet and say, here, read this. They're going to be like, read? Where's the pictures at? Where's the videos? Well, you know, if you ain't willing to read it, you ain't going to. Okay. Well, let's just hand them 1,189 chapters of the Bible and say, here, figure it out. No, you wouldn't do that. We have to realize we're in a different age, and I thank God that we've got some stability. But we also have enough sense to realize we have a new generation coming in, and if we're not willing to adapt some without compromising, we're not going to be able to reach this next generation. You've got to eat off the old corn i got to move. I want you to notice the next thing here as we work through this. Come over to chapter 5 and look down toward the end here. Chapter 5, after they eat the manna. Here's Joshua. Everything seems to be going well. Verse number 13, Joshua's there. He lifts up his eyes. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Here's the captain of the host. Are you for us or our adversaries? Verse 13. Verse 14. Nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. There has to be a succession of God's order. There has to be a slaying by God's circumcision, but there has to be a surrendering to God's captain. A surrendering to God's captain. You know, God's sword is bigger than our sword. Here, Joshua, he's a great and mighty warrior here. Joshua is the general. Joshua is the guy that succeeded Moses. Joshua is the guy that was with Caleb that said, hey, those giants are nothing. God's a whole lot bigger than they are. But Joshua falls down under the submission of the angel of the Lord, and he realized his sword's a whole lot bigger than mine is. You see, Joshua was in submission to God's captain. I don't know if you've heard of uh, King Louis the Fourteenth. They call him Louis the Great because he called himself that. And he was a king of uh, France for like 72 years. He died in like 1715. And when he gave all these orders. He made a, a declaration one time. He said, I am the state. And his, his kingdom was just always lavish. His court was lavish. Everything about it, he, he, over, he went over the top. When he died, he had everything laid out exactly how he wanted it to be, where people would come by and view him. He had this golden, um, this golden uh, uh, coffin. And on top of that coffin, where people would come see him, he had this one candle. And he wanted only that one candle lit where everybody would see all the focus was on him. Like Brother Peacock always says, you're the corpse at every funeral. You know, the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. So all the attention was on him. And the bishop, when he got ready to do the eulogy and do the message, the bishop leaned over and he extinguished the candle and he said, only God is great. Big as you think you are, there's somebody big. 
Joshua's great, Moses is great, all the patriarchs are great. Man, it's going to be awesome to see David one day and the Apostle Paul. All of them are great, but none are like Jesus. He's the captain of our salvation. He's the angel of the Lord. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the Alpha and the Omega. You have your very thought processes because He is the Word. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He is the captain of our salvation. And Joshua submitted under that. He surrendered to that captain. You know where I'm going to this. The preacher preached on it. It follows real good in line because you have to realize if Joshua is going to be a leader, he's got to be in submission. But if Joshua is willing to be in submission, the ones under Joshua have to be willing to be in submission. You know when men want to do things, they come up with committees. Churches have committees. We're going to have a committee and we'll have five ladies on this committee board and we'll have 35 ladies on this committee board and we'll find this man over here with these three ladies and we'll let them be on this uh, advisory board. When God wants to do something, He raises up a man. And I didn't say a woman. Nothing against you ladies. Thank God for you ladies. Thank God for godly women. But God did not call you to be pastors or to be deacons or to be leaders and preachers. Thank God you can encourage. Thank God you can witness. But God raises up a man to lead His people. And He raises up this man right here for this church. Right here. That doesn't mean you're always going to agree with Him. But you are to surrender under God's authority. I want to give you just a few things about this, if I can. Your pastor is under God's leadership. He realizes, like Joshua did, verse number 15, that he is under the submission of the Lord. He tells them, loose your shoe, just like he told Moses. I love how we see this succession. You know, Moses laid his hands on Joshua. There was a time when Moses and Joshua went in the tabernacle. You know the passage. And Moses came out, but it says Joshua stayed in there. Joshua had his own touch. And now Joshua's got his experience where the angel says, take your shoes off. So where's that place at? Let's go see if we can find it. Let's take a trip to Israel can find this place. I'm sure they have a little sign and they have a marker and we can see where that place is holy. Yeah. You're missing the whole point. It's holy because of who was there. Not because of the place. Yeah, right. D.L. Moody or one of the old preachers, I forget who it was, said, all ground is holy where the Christian walks. You realize you're never alone. You know Jesus Christ is with you. And that's so comforting to know. I don't, you can't think of yourself as an individual anymore. You have to think of yourself as Christ is in me. So when I think about what I want to do, I say, Lord, what do you want to do? Because you're with me. Everywhere I go, you're going. So Lord, what do you want to look at? What do you want to talk about? What do you want to listen to? Every place for the Christian is holy ground. Joshua realized that he had to submit under God's leadership. And God has put a man in the local assembly you have to submit to. He said, oh, no, I can't believe this pastor or authority. Listen to me for just a second. He is not a quote-unquote walking around man of God preacher. And I, by the terminology, I know that's a Bible terminology, but if you understand how I'm using this, some people try to abuse their authority by using a position to push their authority. We're not talking about abuse of authority. What we're talking about is submission and obedience. Those are two different things. Obedience is an action. Submission is an attitude. You can obey without submitting, but you cannot submit without obeying. And if you can't submit to a man's leadership, you, don't, you can't submit to God. Talk about dispensations. Let me part with Noah and human government for just a minute. When God set up dispensation of human government, He established things to where even, even men that aren't saved rule over other people and have authority over other people. And God tells those people, even under bad governments, like the Apostle Paul, like the Apostle Peter under Nero, He says, submit to the authorities. You say, well, I can't believe that policeman told me what to do. Hey, it's, listen to me here. It's not the policeman that has, you know, donut stuff all over his face. I'm just being funny. We have a lot of law enforcement in our church. I love policemen. I love law enforcement. He represents the laws of the state. It's what he represents. It's what the man and the authority and the position represents. 
He's not anything because he has a title. God has given him a title so he can fill that position. So he can have that opportunity to do what God's called him to do. So preacher, I'm ready to go after it. Okay, God's going to put some of himself in Shulam. Just like you read in the Old Testament, so and so did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of, it'll say David, his father. And so and so walked in the ways and, he, and it'll give you somebody to look at as an example to say, you know what, I can follow the leader. I want to go after it. I want to follow God. And God will say, okay, I'm going to give you an example. And he'll put somebody in your life. He said, preacher, I really want to go after it. Okay, you've got to be willing to submit. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, obey rule over you. Now, this is not some crazy submission where abuse of authority is a place where you go and say, Pastor, can I buy a new pair of shoes? He says, I don't know. Let me look at your feet. <laughs> Let me see how worn out your shoes are. It's not a thing where the pastor says, I want you to write down on a piece of paper how much money you spent for cat food in the last two years. <laughs> and then compare that to how much you gave to missions. It's not, that's not that type of a thing. Pastors rule as far as spiritual matters are concerned. But there has to be a surrendering to God's captain. I believe we have great opportunities ahead. I love to hear stories of Pastor, just like Pastor Fernandez, and the things that God has done in his life and his ministry. That's encouraging to me. It's good to know, to hear some things going on in a church. Pastor Kim has told me some good things going on here. Some souls that have been saved. Some encouraging things about the new property that y'all have that you're able to move. All those things are encouraging to realize we can go after it. There's a blessing to be had if we can be found faithful. It's good to be encouraged. Go after it. But there are some steps. Don't get ahead of yourself. Some of you, like the preacher mentioned earlier, you need some time to grow. Maybe it's not time for you to be in charge of some ministry. Maybe you just need to be under a ministry. Maybe instead of running a marathon, I mean running a sprint, you need to prepare for a marathon. The Bible talks about the simplicity. The simplicity of the Christian life. We must learn the lessons of the past so we can proceed in the future. Eventually, the nation of Israel learned not to make idols. It took them a while. But they finally did learn not to make images. They got that one. But I imagine that second generation, they had to always think back of the whole years of wandering in the wilderness and all the things that God did. And of course, they remember those that might have been too young to remember the Red Sea, now they had the Jordan River experience. God will put some things in your life, not just from the distant past, but from the, from the uh, pretty close past, to help you gain some momentum. And that's what this whole thing is leading up to. He wants to lead up to get them in some momentum. But you've got to bury some things. And you've got to deal with inner conquest. We're so busy sometimes trying trying to save the world that we don't save our families. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Sometimes we're so busy on the external appearance the inner life. We neglect our personal devotion time. We neglect, neglect being honest with ourselves and taking out that sword and cutting those hard places in our heart. And if you neglect that, you're not going to be able to make it on the battlefield. You're going to still be trying to eat off the old man, and the man is going to disappear, and you're going to get hungry. We've got to learn to follow God's order and be willing to surrender and submit to Him. Say over in the Middle East, they train those Arabian horses. What they do is they go through a rigorous period of training and testing and get them obeying commands. One of the last tests that they will do with those horses is they will get them uh, tr just basically wore down. And they'll have them in a place where they've been water deprived. 
for so many days. I mean, no water. And then they get them to a place where they can let them loose and it's close to where the water is. And of course, immediately, they take off to the water. So then they blow the whistle, they sound the signal, they give the command for them to stop and return to see if they'll stop and return at that point. And if they'll stop and return at that point, they pass the test. You see, you never really know what you are until you get to those hard places. It's easy to say some of this stuff, but when you have to live it, and there you are, the Jordan, there you are crossing over, and there you are having to realize, all right, I've got to do introspection. Instead of just having descriptive preaching where I describe everybody else's faults, I'm going to have to have some prescriptive preaching where I have some prescriptions written for my sickness. And I'm going to have to take my medicine. Don't do like the one guy did. The, guy, the doctor told him, look, you need to take, go home take your prescription. He came back a week later and said, Doc, I ain't no better. I did what you said. He goes, you took the prescription? He goes, yeah. I went home and I took it and I ripped it up. And I put it in water and stirred it up and it got soggy and I drank it. He took the piece of paper, the prescription, and he put it in the water. And he took the prescription. I'm literal. I'm dispensational. This ain't for me. This is, this is Matthew 5, 6, 7. Ain't nothing in there for me. That's all dispensational. Old Testament. Who needs the Old Testament? Oh, oh James. I don't need James. Hebrews. Who needs Hebrews? First, second, third, John. Ah, oh, that's all tribulation. Don't need that. You ain't got no Bible left. Amen. All of it's for you. Yes. Devotion. Prescriptive. Take it and apply it. When God puts you in a place, you say, okay, Pastor made a decision. Yeah, he might not be right, but you know what? I'm going to submit under his leadership. It's not a matter of doctrine. It's not a matter of thing. People fall out of church, and here's what I've seen, and preachers will probably testify with this. When people get mad over some silly thing, there's been something in the background brewing the whole time. Amen. Discontentment has been brewing the whole time. Jealousy has been brewing the whole time. Some of you need to eat a good piece of humble pie. You're not so big and bad as you think you are. You're not big enough not to have to submit under and say, you know what, teach me. Let me learn. Let me be a help. Let me be a blessing. Let me just carry something. Let me encourage somebody instead of being in the limelight. You ready to go after it? I think we can go after it. The path's been opened up, but there are some steps we've got to be willing to take if we're going to go after it. Amen, preacher.